hello everyone hope that you're doing well welcome to our channel let's talk operation management today we're talking about human resources job design and work measurement again which is chapter 10 that is based on a book of jay hazer and barry render which is about supply chain uh, and sustainability well uh before going any further with this uh video we are going first of all to visualize a small video about human resource how it applied in uh at nasco which is the national company of uh, racing in uh, in america and then after the video we'll be able to discuss further in the chapter All six of them are, are key players in it. They all have to work together to make our stop under 11 or 12 seconds. You take the car up, pull the tires off. Yeah? That's it. Okay, cool. I make sure everybody else is safe. A lot of muscle memory, a lot of practice, weight lifting, weight training, yoga. Do you find yourself going around and just jacking things up? Nope, not at all, not at all. Only my kids, I've tossed them up every now and again, but that's about it. Those jacks that they use to jack up the race car, I can't even get the jack up. It takes me like three or four pumps to where they do it in one. Then you have a gas man, so the guy who carries the, the fuel jug over the wall. When the car comes in for service, that is the guy that puts the gas in the car. Yeah, you can dump about 12 gallons in about six seconds. It's fun. It's, um, it's a hurry up and wait kind of deal. So it's like chilling, bored. Next thing you know, the car's coming in and you're going like a thousand miles per hour. So it, it just kind of like peaks and valleys, you know. And then our rears, he carries the tires, puts them on the car while the changer uh, will put the lug nuts on. That 11 or 12 seconds when the car is just sitting there, I'm pretty patient. I do all the adjustments on the rear of the car. So if Ryan's crying that it's uh, loose or tight or whatever, I'll do all the adjustments. So how fast is all this, this whole process? Uh, we better be doing about 1150s. The 12Os are going to be getting fired. I'll mess around sometimes and go to their practice and, and change tires just to fuck around, but I'm not the, the right build that they have to be. Even the, the smaller tire changers, they're stocky dudes and, and they got to be really quick hands. They, they mean a lot. They can win us or, or lose us a race. They work really hard all season to always get better and better. It's so hard to get a win in this sport. The more that I've gotten to know those guys, the more confident it makes me. And now if I make a little mistake, they just give me a hard time. The important thing is that we have each other's backs. During the off season and stuff, we'll go out together. It's more than just hanging out the racetrack we put so much passion into uh, this sport that relationship carries off the racetrack you can build a relationship with them and that's just going to make your team stronger when you have a, a good relationship with those guys well i think that it's about the video it was just repeating itself now um first of all where are we going this is actually a map of what we're supposed to do for the course of the video the first thing we're going to talk about labor planning which is about employment stability policies work schedules job classification and work uh, rules then there's job design and after we'll talk about the economics and the work environment and then we're gonna end the video with uh, the labor standard now one thing that we need to know first of all about human resource what is human resource and why are we talking about it well we are operation managers and as managers we know that most of our roles resume themselves into um leading planning controlling uh, supervising and all those things but now when we say for example leading you don't you lead people when we say we control we control a process that is actually performed by people so it's just important for us to understand that we need we will be working with people the company won't be just working from itself with you and the machineries it will need people to operate them so you need to be able to understand actually human being you need to be able to uh understand everything that comes with them so that you're gonna be able actually to produce more than what you're supposed to produce and be more reliable now the reason behind human 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 resource is just it's one of the assets that are the most important in a company why because it's one of the few that you cannot copy or it's one it's the only one that you cannot copy in your competitors uh process for example let me take an example of an employee if we take for example uh a player like messi there's only one messi one christian that is that is playing in a football team now another team cannot say for example that we will copy and paste another messi the messi from barcelona to our team x it is impossible which means that 
an employee is one or employees are the only asset or the only resource that a company can have that it uh how do you call them its competitors cannot actually copy this is even what makes it even more interesting and more intriguing so the importance actually this, this now resume to the importance of human resource which says that the, the objective of human resource strategy is to manage the labor and design jobs so that people are eff eff effectively and efficiently used what happened is that because we know that we have employees or we have people that we cannot copy and paste we now need actually to to to, to define ways so that we'll we'll use them properly if for example someone his job is good at everything that deals with computers and so on we cannot put him in another uh, department that he won't be dealing with computers so we need to find ways to place the person in the right position so that they might give the right output this is actually everything about human resource now we say that the importance of human resources like people should be utilized effectively within the constraint of other operation decision people should have a reasonable quality of life and atmosphere of mutual commitment and trust that's what the image is there it means that that small image just shows that we pick one person and we place him exactly where he fits so that it might he is going to be very productive for the environment and for the company we wouldn't there are some people that can be for example very good in the it department but you take him and you put him maybe in the delivery department it's a waste because the person won't be performing the way it's supposed to be. This is another example on a basic level. You cannot take a goalkeeper and place him as a forward and take the forward. You put them also uh, in the goals and say that you will be the goalkeeper. The performance is not going to be the same. That means we need to actually assess the employees based on the quality so that we place them at the right place so that they might be efficiently and effectively used. The second point is talking about the reasonable quality of life. We know that we are human beings. We are working with people that have feelings, that have emotions, that have family. The importance of human human resource in this case is about providing a good quality of life. People are not just working; they are working, but they need to be able to um, they need to be able to find themselves in a position whereby they are able to feel like whatever I'm working is not killing my health. First, I'm feeling safe, I'm feeling trusted, and I'm in an environment that will help me grow. That is actually the point of human resource strategy mainly in operation management. Now, the constraint of a human strategy, of a human resource strategy, it is, on this slide here, what we are going to talk about is about all the constraints that come with human strategy. What are the things that a company should look um should look or should take a focus on before we start actually implementing a proper human strategy. The first thing is the product strategy, which is on the top left. It's saying that when a company want actually to start, the first thing that we need to 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 consider as far as the human concern, the human services concern, is about the what. It is part about the what we need to determine what are the skills that I'm gonna need, what are the talent, what are the material, and all the safety measures that I'm going to need, so that my people are feeling safe. You cannot start or you won't start a company if you don't even know what are the people that you are going to 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 you will need. The second thing is about when. By when, it's mainly about the schedule. I have my company, I have my staff. When am I going to need my staff? When is my company going to uh, to operate? Which time of the day? Which time of the year? Is it something that is seasonal or something that is permanent? Another thing is where. Location is very important as far as a business is concerned because you'll find out that there are some businesses that will sell specific product only in specific areas. I gave you the example last time about uh, McDonald's saying that the burgers that McDonald's is selling in countries like South Africa are not the same that are being sold in countries like India or in Mexico, for example, whereby in India they don't eat beef. So most of the burgers that are going to be produced, they won't have beef inside. Likewise, in Mexico, they lack so much spicy food that most of the burgers will have chili and then it will be spicy compared to other um to, to the mcdonald in other location so all these things should be considered before as far as the location is concerned there's also the climate the temperature the noise the light and so on you want if you take for example an employee that is coming from a hot 
uh, a country with a hot climate and you put him in another country that is very cold even if the employee is still going to perform he won't perform in the same uh, at the same rate because it's not exposed to the same conditions there's also the process strategy whereby we talk about the technology and the machinery the equipment uh, that have been used obviously there's also safety once you have identified your business you're like what are the technologies that i'm going to use am i you uh, now we're talking about the fourth industrial revolution we need computers we need people actually that are computer compute computers literate in that case we need people that are, are they know actually the basics about computers now in that case i won't hire anyone i will hire someone that has a little a little bit of a background with computers so that my process won't be jeopardized next we have the individual differences the strength and the fatigue the information processing and the response you'll find out that it's uh, according to some researches you find it, it seems like people from asia mainly china and japan those people they work more than eight hours compared to the other to other in, in other part of the world and so on so the strength and the fatigue all these things come in place so you need to know for example that my work is going to be a physical work which require a b c d which require people to have these capacities my work is an intellectual work which require a b c d and it requires so and so then finally we have the layout strategy this one applies to all company the layout that a company like um i think we talk about layout strategy uh in our previous videos a layout that um shop right is going is going to have is not the same layout that the university of johannesburg is going to have because they are offering different product the layout at shop right will be a layout that is more about a retail output compared to the university which is more we get to, to get probably classrooms and then we'll get also the office layouts to facilitate the move of information all of these should be take, taken in consideration let's take an example of the university of johannesburg with the University of Johannesburg, we know that first of all, it's a university <laughs> by the name. But now these are the few things. This is how the constraint of human resources apply. Firstly, if we need to look at the product strat uh, strategy, we're talking about the skill, the talent, the material that are needed. It's a university. That means mainly we will need security. We will need cleaners, we will need lecturers, we will need doctors, we will need professors. And all of these staff have a specific role security it's more for the security of the university protection of the people and the materials cleanliness it's keep the place clean for our lectures and all this thing same thing for the lectures and the doctors the professors all of these they just come as far as the education is concerned now all these staffs are put together so that we are going to uh, to ensure that there's a proper functioning of the university then the, the schedule the university doesn't uh, doesn't open any time there's a specific calendar that has been already uh, put in place whereby we know that from February to this time, there's term one, term two, first semester, second semester, and so on. This is a graduation period. This is a time for study and all these things. So these are part of the schedule. Location strategy, it's a university. Remember in our previous videos, when we talk about the difference between service and product, we find out that services are generally located next to people because they are needed most of the time compared to products which are generally located far from people because they need to be manufactured outside then they are brought next to people that would be sold in this case the university is offering the service of education and nobody is going to be willing to stay at any i mean to study at a university that is miles away from where they are staying so that's why the universities are in big cities and people come next to the city to the they come within the cities and they're next to the universities just for proximity uh, purpose with the customers which are mainly the student then process strategies this is about actually defining that what are the tools that you are going to do which is the technology that we are using in this case lectures conducted with technological tools such as internet computers labs and so on so even if you need to be hired you need actually to have the basic technological skills which is about having a computer how to make a slide how to set a test how to conduct this kind of videos how to use the internet how to conduct research how to perform experiences in a lab all of these are part of the process then there's also the individual differences you'll find out that the university of johannesburg 
of Johannesburg is one of the universities in South Africa with a, a huge diversity of staff. You find staff from different backgrounds, from different countries, from different uh, educational background. The good thing with that is like it enriches actually the student because every staff come with his own experience, which actually helps build a uh, student that, that, that are actually full of knowledge. Then you have the layout strategy. The layout at the university, like I say, is not the same thing as in a supermarket. At the university, we more about office layout for department. For department, for example, you find that you have offices in department, and those offices have have been positioned in the way that communication between staff is actually eased. Then there's also the layout that we have in classrooms for lectures and so on, which is different. So if we have to pick another company outside of UJ, we can still develop the same constraint, but with different things. This is actually something that you can do on your own. You decide, for example, I'm going to pick a company like Ford and I'm going to try to design the constraint of the human resource. And it's just a small exercise that you can do. Next, we have labor planning which is still uh, employment stability. You will find out that in this, in, on this slide, we're talking about the employment stability of a company. Do all companies have the same employee employment stability? By employment stability, we mean, in simple terms, the types of contract that you can have in companies. You have actually companies that, fall with, that follow a demand exactly. This means that they match the direct labor cost of the production. It means that the more we produce, the more we need people. The less we produce, the less we need people. So it incurs cost in hiring and termination and employment, insurance, premium wages. So generally in this case, labor is treated as a variable cost. Variable because the first month we must produce less so we can have just 10 employees. The second month we will produce more. Maybe we will need 20 employees. So the, 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 the salary or the labor is going to change based on the number of people that we are hiring. Generally, companies that apply this will find pick and pay, Edgar, ShopRite, Jet, and so on. These companies will find out that during period whereby the sales are not really high, like December and so on, we don't have many people. We only have people. You, that's why you'll find out that there are so many counters, maybe 20 of them, but they only have two people that are working because the demand is not high. When we reach Christmas period and so on in New Year's, you'll find out that many people are buying and we need actually to improve, I mean, to increase the number of people. The second one is those companies that hold employment constant. In this case, we maintain trained workforce, we minimize the hiring, termination, and employment cost. Employees may be underutilized during the slack period. Labor is treated as a fixed cost. Now, what happened in this case is like we have employees. Whether they work, whether they don't work, whether the demand is huge or not, do, not huge, we are still going to have those employees and we're still going to pay them. That's why the last uh, bullet is saying that the labor is treated as a fixed cost. I know that I have 100 employees. I'm paying each one of them 200. So I'm going to have something like 20,000 that I'm going to be paying. This one is a fixed cost. It doesn't matter whether we produce or we don't produce. Depending on company, you find that company like, for example, football team like Kaza Chief, they have employees, they have players, and those players are being paid. Whether they play, they play or they don't play, whether they're injured or they're not injured, they're still going to be paid the same amount. Same thing with the university, with staff. If you have a, prim you have a permanent staff, even if you have a contract, whether you lecture or you don't lecture, whether there's a class or there's no class on that day, you are still going to be paid. Now, none of these, uh, none of none of these um, policies are, are good. It just depends on one and the company. There's no one. There's none of it that will say it's better than the other one. It just depends. At the university, for example, it wouldn't make sense to have a lecture. Uh, different lectures for, for the same class during the course of the year. That's why it is better to have one staff that is there from the beginning of the end of, of the year till the end of the year. But because actually students get attached to the lecture and they need to, some of them learn easily when it's just one person. But when you go, for example, to ShopRite, you don't get attached to the counter. Unless you go there every time and you have a specific relation with the counter. But most of the time what happens is like you don't even... There are people that you just meet today and tomorrow don't even remember their faces anymore. So that's why it's not really a problem. That's why employment is not really constant in that case. Next, we have the work schedule. Depending on companies, you'll find out that there are companies that have a standard work schedule, which is generally a five days with eight hours each. Then you also have companies that have a flex time, 
which actually allows employee within the limit to determine their own schedule. You are, they tell you, for example, that you need to achieve 45 hours a week. Now, with flex time, you are the one that decides how I'm going to manage these hours as long as I meet my 48. Same thing with the flexible work week. Which one will you work fewer but longer days? You can decide, for example, instead of me working eight days or five hours, I can maybe increase them to 10 uh, hours per day and it will decrease my number of days. Then the spot time, which, which is generally this kind of employment that you get, uh, whereby you don't have many hours and those hours are not even regular. What happened with them is like they'll tell you, for example, you're coming to work Monday, Wednesday, Friday. You're working maybe from 10 to 2 or from 10 to 3 and that's it. And you don't even have a permanent contract most of the time. It's just for a short period of time only. Next, we have the job classification and the work rules. What happened in this case here, on this slide, we're talking about uh, what are the different work that you can have and what are the different rules. You find out that whenever you set, a, you have, an empl you have a, a company, one thing that you need to do is to be able to specify first who needs to do what to specify when, when uh, they can do it, to specify under which condition they can do it. Generally, these kind of criteria, they result in what we call union contract. In South Africa, we talk about COSA too. And we have also the restrict, uh, restrict uh, flexibility in assignment, consequently efficient in production. Whenever you get an employee, let's say you, the employee is coming for an interview, Obviously, you need to tell him that this is the scope of your work. This is what you would be doing from this time to this time. They fall under the work rules. And this work rule depend on one job to another. That's why we call job classification now. That the sum work where, for example, the time at which you come at work doesn't really matter as long as you achieve what is needed. There are some other companies whereby the time at which you come really matters the most. So it depends on one company to another. Next, we have uh, labor speciali uh, specialization. Labor specialization actually has been introduced uh, introduced by Adam Smith later, in, I mean, early in the uh, 1776. The idea was actually to have people that are doing just a specific job. If my job is to paint a car in a workshop, that is my job. If your job is to put a tire in the, uh, in the workshop, that is going to be your job until you leave the company well it got different advantages in the way that people actually they get very good to what they are doing this is why they say that there's a development of dexterity because dexterity means are uh, you being actually uh, able to do a job so well uh, uh, because you have acquired that skill that you are doing it so well now there's no loss or losses minimized and so on which brings to the second point about less loss time then there's also development of special tools because i've been doing a job more every day the same way then i can develop new techniques to be good at what i'm doing this is the good thing then later it has been implemented again uh, another aspect which has been uh, paying people based on the skills if my skill for example is to do job a properly i'm paid 100 rand for it by the time i acquire another skills i'll be paid twice because I've learned two skills. This is what Charles Babash introduced. Well, the advantage with that, like we said, we have development of dexterity, less loss of time and all these things. But the disadvantage is like sometimes people get bored because we found out that with some still doing the same job the same way every day and it becomes tired, tired, tiresome. Then we have what we call job enlargement. A, a, a job enlargement in this case is being a solution to job specialization what does it mean job enlargement it means that you are actually given the opportunity to learn another job that is still on your level but you can just acquire a new skill with the advantage of being paid more which is now different from job enrichment job enrichment most of the time is something that is horizontal which means that you are moving from a lower level to an upper level in that case, you are even paid more because, for example, you were just a normal employee. Your job was just maybe to clean, let's say, to, to just, just to clean the tires of a car. That was your job. With job enlargement, you will still be cleaning, but not the tires anymore, but maybe the entire car. Obviously, you won't be paid the same amount. But now, you are still a cleaner, but on a lower level. Now, with job in, uh, enrichment is that 
you are a cleaner but now you're not a cleaner anymore you have been promoted horizontally to be for example a manager you'll be now the one controlling other cleaners that one comes as job enrichment while job enlargement is having a job on the same level but it is you have, you have just acquired more skills like i'm a lecturer but job enlargement i'm lecturing one module job enlargement i'm now giving two or three modules my job has been enlarged but job enrichment now is i'm a lecturer but now i'm not a lecturer giving two or three modules now i'm now the hod i've been enriched on another level so we have the core job characteristics. In this case here, we're talking about the characteristic of a job. What makes a job interesting? You have skill variety. This is the kind of job that requires the worker to use a variety of skills and talent. You have job identity, which is actually allows the worker to perceive the job as a whole and recognize a talent and is recognized from the beginning till the end. Let me focus on the two first. Skill variety in this case is about having this job that requires you to use many skills. The good thing with that is that employees do not get tired because they feel like their job is interesting. Today I might need IT skills, tomorrow I might need communication skills, tomorrow I might need team, lead, team leading skills and all these things. Your job got actually so many things and even when you go to, go to job, you are motivated. Which is now different from this job whereby you just are doing the same thing over and over. Job identity is actually, it refers in simple terms, it refers to a student. I mean, not to a student, to an employee, how he identifies himself with the job. In the in a term of a student, it's how you identify yourself with the course that you have chosen. You know, there are some courses you're just doing and you're like, why did I even decide to do this? But now, there are also some other courses where you're like, I felt like this module or this course was meant for me because I understand, I like it. Same thing for employees. They're like, am I just in this job because I want to get money? Oh, I'm just in this job because I really like the job. Even though the pay is not great, but I identify myself with the job. I like it. I'm so happy with everything that is happening. Because you'll find people, they are well paid, but they are not happy in, in an organization. Next, we have job significance. It's providing a sense that the job has an impact on the organization and society. So in this case, we have an employee that is working, but he just feels like his job is useless. Whether he's there or he's not there, he just feels like he's not even appreciated. So... This also affect on the human uh, on the human resources. There's also the autonomy. It's offering freedom, independence, and discretion. This just means that there's this employee that is working that does not always need someone to tell him that whatever you're doing is right, whatever you're doing is wrong. Because sometimes employees want to take action. You don't want to, you don't just want to go to work and start doing a job from the beginning till the end. The same thing. You want someone, I mean, from the beginning till the end, someone is just do this, do that, do that, and so on. You want also to be autonomous. You want to be working for yourself, take your own decision, and be able to be accountable. It also makes people valued at, be, uh, feel valued at work, at work. There's also the feedback. Feedback in this case is actually allowing the employee to work. And when the employee is done working, then you tell him, you now provide live feedback where you tell him that your your performance is good, this is what you did that was good, this is what you did that was bad, and so on. Once all these characteristics have been met, you will find out that the employee himself, even at work, is satisfied. The performance is increasing. Next, we have self-directed teams. The good thing, first of all, with teams is like teams are good because they are studies have shown that they are more productive or they are more efficient than when one person is doing the work that when a group is working is like we have it we have a set of many people that are working together to reach a common goal so different self-directed teams are these teams that it's like a small department but they are working with their own leaders so that they can achieve the goal of the company the company journey doesn't care much about what needs to be done and how it needs to be done. What we need, I mean, the company doesn't care much about how things should be done. They only care about what needs to be done. As long as it is done, that is the most important thing. So these teams are generally effective because they provide employee empowerment. They ensure, a core, they, they ensure that the core job characteristic, which has been defined in the previous slide, uh, are being met and individual psychological need like we say the good thing now because as a team we need to have first because it's a small team we need people to feel value we need people to be autonomous we want them to use as many skills as possible and employee feel empowered because it's more like they have been entrusted by the company like do this we don't care how you will do it as long as you have reached uh, your objective 
then we have the benefit uh, of teams and expanded job design so the benefit of these teams and when we expand the job is like you improve the quality of the work life you improve the job satisfaction you increase the motivation you imp the employee uh, accept more uh, responses and so on those are actually advantage those are actually benefit of teams in the way that when you have a team for example like we say by work by quality of work life we just mean that employees being happy with the job employee being happy with the salary and everything that is happening because it is a small team people feel like everyone is useful there's no one that is useless it is a small team of five people everyone needs to do his job everyone feels value and with that people feel important they are coming at work because they feel like they will be needed which is now different from an employee who just come to work because he need to fill his position. Even though he's well paid, most of the people they won't just be satisfied in it's more like you are there but you're not there. Even if you're there, we don't you're not really useful. And it affects the psychology of the of the worker, which also affects even the all his all performance. The limitation now about job expansion. Remember what we said about job expansion. Job expansion we say that it is mainly horizontal and what happened in job expansion is we need to uh, maybe i was doing one job now i'll be given another job still on the same level now what happened limitation with it first of all is that that it requires higher capital cost individual may prefer simple job higher wages rate for greater skills smaller level pool and higher training cost so let me touch one of these the first thing is the uh, higher capital cost Obviously, we say that if you have one skill, we pay you an amount. We pay you actually based on the number of skills. The more skills you know, the more salary we'll pay you. So a company will need not to have more capital because if people keep on learning a lot, we need to pay them a lot, which now becomes also another problem to our, to our finance. But it won't be a problem if the company owns a lot of money. Now, the second thing is individuals may prefer simple jobs. You know, as much as we say that people like change, people like A, B, C, D, you'll find out that there are still some people in life that do, do not want to grow. They want to stay in the comfort zone. It doesn't care even if the salary is going to increase or decrease. All I want is to be doing my job. It's my job is to paint the car. This is what I'll be doing there. If employees do not want to grow, it also can also be a problem. Higher wages rate for greater skills, which relate to the first one that I said. You have a smaller level pool, which means that you have few people actually that are willing to, to be groomed, that are willing to be trained to know new things. Especially when you've been doing a job for 5, 10, 15 years, you feel like, I don't want to learn anything. I just want to stay in my comfort zone. And it might cost actually a lot to the company if they want to train employees to learn new skills. Those are few limitations of job expansion. Then you have motivation and incentive system. Well, you find that, that depending on countries and on, lo on location, different countries have different, different motivation and different people have different actually uh ways of seeing or of seeing life there are other people other companies will say for example that one way to motivate employees is by giving them bonuses is by increasing for example on the salary because we want to reward good behaviors because you have always on time because you have been customer of the mouth all of these things affect actually the behaviors of of employees at work because imagine when you are late at the company your boss will always shout at you and so on and when you're on time he doesn't say anything you don't you don't get any compliment even if i was on time last time next time i'll be like well it doesn't change anything getting reward getting profit and so on when you feel like your company cares about you your company cares about your safety it affects even your loyalty to the company so you'll find out that mainly in africa employees the more the only motivation that we tend to get most of the time is is money once everything that i get once i'm doing well i get a bonus i'm happy in other in other countries maybe you'll find out that as much as there's money but they want recognition I want to get money, yes, but I want also maybe certificate, trophies, or I don't care about money as long as a certificate and so on. It just depends on countries. It just depends on the types of employees. But at least every company should have a motivation or intense incentive system so that they can reward, reward actually employees. We can reward them maybe based on the knowledge-based system. We reward the employees that are more knowledgeable or they got many skills. We can reward them maybe based on um 
if they always come on time to work and so on but that one it's actually depending on the company on which way they will use to reward and give motivation to 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 the employees so we have ergonomics and the work environment by ergonomics what we mean is that um we are studying the interface between human and machines this is really important when you look at the image on the screen you'll find out that even the chairs the desktop wherever you'll be working even in class you will find out that the chairs that we use during lectures are not the same chairs that you use when there's a party for example because you know that you'll be seated for a while you need chairs that are comfortable you need to take a specific angle so that you don't get tired even if you are seated for a while you'll find out that there are many people whenever they have been seated in the same position they are now feeling some pains of the body and all these things so ergonomics is this study whereby we look at our environment there's a reason why, for example, all the mouse, whenever they have been decided, the mouse that you use for, for, for computer, they have been, they have been designed with a specific way because they know that this is the ergonomic way. Apparently, every time that you are studying or every time that you are working in an office, for example, you always need to be working in a 90 degree position. But when you look at the image on the left, you find out that the person is not sitting really properly, is a bit bent, and by the time it's, it's done, you find out that he's have a problem with his back compared to the other one that has been seated actually uh, properly. So this is what you need to consider as far as the ergonomics and the work environment is concerned. Another thing is the environment over which the person is, is working. Well, uh, they were normally they were... Um, there was another image at the back there, but I, 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 it's a mistake. There was supposed to be another animation. But the example of an office that you are seeing in front of you with blue desk and so on, everyone will work, will, would want to work in an environment like this. You find out that it's clean. There's enough hair that is passing through, which is actually different if you had to work in a small confined office whereby maybe it's a small office. Instead of being shared by 10 people, it is shared probably by 20. It's clustered. There's no even way to move. It won't even affect you to work properly. So when we are dealing with human resource, we need to consider the environment over which my employees are working. Is it actually a proper environment? Would I be happy if I was working in that environment? So you need actually to consider the noise, the temperature, the humidity, the illumination. Is there enough life in a, enough light in the office? Because the, the amount of light will depend on the types of work. There are some works, for example, whereby you need so much light because you are paying attention to details. Example, people that are working in jewelry, store, jewelry stores, for example, which, one, which will be different from people that are just working in normal computer rooms or in normal labs, for example. The noise, the temperature, and all these things should be put um, together. You'll find out that, for example, if we, are, we, are, we, are, we have this big classroom, in an, an environment whereby it's very hot, we will need air cones and all those things so that we can regulate the temperature and allow people to work properly. Next, we have the labor standard. What is labor standard? For every company, you will find out that there's always a standard about how a work should be done. We say, for example, that for you to do this work, you need to do, to know A, B, C, D. You need to follow this procedure A, B, C, D. And work, labor standards are always important because even though sometimes companies do not clarify it clearly, but they are always there. So they just tell you that in this company, this is what we do. This is what we don't. They know they'll tell you the do's and the don't. This is what you have to know. This is what you don't have to know. These are the questions that you can ask. These are not the questions that you can ask. Whenever you are performing this machine, you need to start by one, two, three, four. All of those are actually labor standard. So it says that it is effective manpower, manpower planning is dependent on, an, on the knowledge of the labor required labor standard are the more uh, are the amount of time required to perform a job or a part of a job it is accurate uh, accurate labor standard also help determine the labor requirement the cost the fair work and so on my labor standard they also tell you that this job generally they'll tell you for example that to manufacture this product it needs to take you three hours if you do less than two, two hours you are effective and efficient but if you do it in more than three hours you have done the work, but you are not efficient. You are just effective. And that is a problem because you need to be both effective and efficient. 
Effective actually means that we are doing the work, no matter how long it will take. Efficient means that I'm doing the work in the uh, the set time or the standard time. And companies want people to be um, effective and efficient. The reason that there are the labor standards because this is the only way that we can assess how good people are doing their work. Now we have how to set how to set the labor standard. First of all, there is historical experience. They will tell you, for example, that this job over time it has been done, but in average, people take five hours to do the job. This is a, a, an historical experience. Then, with that, we can say, since in average, people take five hours, then we will set this to be five hours. It's more like the number of hours that we give you to write a test. It is generally two hours because we assume that in the next two hours, you will be done by then. There is time study. Time study, mainly these people that are, uh, people that are doing with management services, this is their job. They are actually studying. They will tell you that to do this job, it will take you this amount of time. Those people, they study the environment, they study the work, the content of the work, and they will come up with a specific time. Those are professional with time studies, time study practitioners. Then there's also... Uh, the predetermined time standard. This one is a time standard that has already been given since the person, even when I got my company, I know, for example, about to, if working in the standard time of eight hours. Everyone knows that you need to work for eight hours. It's, it has been proven that after eight hours, you get tired and all those things. And even the eight hours, you're not working those eight hours straight. You need to have a lunch time in the middle. So you understand that these are predetermined time standards. They have just been there and we follow them. Then there's also work sampling. Work sampling is just about me taking a small group of employees, giving them a job to do based on the amount of time that they will take. Then this is what I'm going to set like the standard. The group that I'm going to select, I need to make sure that it's a representative of the whole population. So if I have kid, I have, well, not really kid, but if I have youth, that is probably between 18 and 25. And I also have people that are maybe 20, uh, 30 and 45. They all need to be part of the sample so that they represent the whole company. And based on the result that I will get, then I can standardize it. So, thank you so much for this video. This was the last slide and I really hope that this part was really interesting and you got to learn a lot. I don't know if it's full of theory and it's one of the longest videos that we have made so far. But thank you so much for stacking to the channel and watching. If you have questions, you can just leave a comment in the comment section, section and feel free also to subscribe to the page. Until I post the next video, take care and...